Hi, this is Dr. Apolito, and this is the lecture on Chapter 7, Photosynthesis. It's expected that you already have mastered the topics on Chapter 7, uh, I'm sorry, 6, uh, which is about energy. So let's get started. So first of all, let's talk about the overall equation important in photosynthesis. carbon dioxide plus water with the input of energy is converted into sugar which we all know is C6H12O6 and actually as we know too this is really glucose that we're going to talk about which is the generic version of hexose right and remember there's two other isomers of hexose what are they? Do you remember? Okay, you got galactose and you got fructose. And remember various combinations of these guys bring you your disaccharides. Okay? Now, let's get back to the basics. This chapter is going to deal with this equation. Okay, and by the way, there's also plus O2, which is a gas. Okay? So, we know that energy flows through systems. Okay? You remember we had the sun. The sun gives energy to Earth. Okay? And when you add uh, energy to a system like Earth, entropy decreases. Okay? What's another way of saying entropy decreases? Right? Remember, Entropy is a measure of chaos, or uh, the evening out of temperature and pressure, where everything's the same. So what's the opposite of that? Okay, order, when you have things build up into discrete areas of temperature and pressure. And uh, so, for example, you go from you know loosely scattered objects to something that looks pretty. Right? Remember the card, the card castle that we always talked about. Okay, so the sun adds energy to Earth. The atmosphere on Earth is thick, so here's Earth. Okay, here are the continents, blah, 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 blah. And we have this atmosphere. Okay, and as the sunlight hits the atmosphere, the atmosphere catches that energy and it gets warm. Okay, so that's why other areas like the moon, the moon is too small to have gravity to attract an atmosphere. So there is no atmosphere on the moon, so therefore when the sun reflects light off the moon, the energy goes back away. Okay? It acts like a big reflector. That's why it's a bright white area in the sky. So Earth, because of its atmosphere, has what we call a greenhouse effect. Okay? Now, yes, over time the energy does leave Earth's atmosphere. Okay? So the energy does radiate back out. So Earth, without the sun, if you put a big wall here, the sunlight can't get to it, Earth would eventually freeze, okay? So the important point here is the sun is constantly giving energy to the Earth, and so Earth has a constant input of free energy, and so things can go uphill. Recall from Chapter 1 that life requires energy and material. Organisms get their energy from the sun, as we just said, if they're autotrophs, Okay? Or they get the energy from other organisms, heterotrophs. You're a heterotroph. You eat other organisms, you get your energy from them. Plants and algae and some bacteria, they get their energy directly from the sun. Okay? Now, even though we all get energy from different sources, all organisms, both the autotrophs and heterotrophs, acquire their material from their environment. Okay? So autotrophs still need sources of nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, carbon, etc. Okay, and plants in particular find this stuff in the soil, while algae in the ocean find it in the water. Heterotrophs, as I said, acquire material from their food, although humans and other animals can also take supplements. So when you take your multivitamin, there's no energy in there, there's, but there's important uh, materials that you need to build various components. And remember, complex organic molecules, like the ones we learned about in the previous chapters, they're built from simpler molecules using energy, which is collected as we talked about up here. 
some of the simplest molecules okay now when I say simplest molecules we're talking about molecules that are the lowest in energy and if you think about it highest in entropy okay and what other factor can you talk about with these talk about uh, are they more stable or less stable okay they're more stable molecules like this we're going to talk about include water and carbon dioxide which came from remember the equation above we had the carbon dioxide plus the water these are molecules that are very low in energy relatively okay plus energy from the Sun and we make sugar okay and as we know sugar has high energy so we're going to see here how plants utilize the energy collected from the Sun okay that energy we call solar photons and we they put this energy into chemical bonds and they build complex molecules where does photosynthesis occur as the Sun radiates the earth with photons on a tree inside a leaf within a mesophyll cell there are chloroplasts inside the chloroplasts are stacks of thylakoids Within the thylakoid's membrane is a biological antenna called a photosystem that absorbs these photons. This energy is converted to chemical bond energy through a series of redox reactions called the light independent reactions, or just light reactions for short. Now let's do an overview of the light dependent reactions, which is how photosynthesis works to collect and convert solar energy to chemical energy. The key players of the light dependent reactions include the thylakoid, both the membrane and the inner space, photosystem 2 and its reaction center. The reaction center consists includes two chlorophyll molecules down in here, as well as a series of other pigment molecules that are used to collect light energy and funnel them into the reaction center's pair of chlorophyll molecules. The electron transport chain, which is basically a series of increasingly powerful redox areas. The electron transport chain, photosystem 1, which is similar to photosystem 2 in its function and some of its structure. NADP reductase, which is an enzyme. And ATP synthase, which is also an enzyme. In step one of the light dependent reactions, solar energy is collected by photosystem 2's reaction center. This energy is funneled into two electrons, which are then passed to the electron transport chain. To regain the lost electrons, photosystem 2 oxidizes water in a process termed photolysis. The two water molecules are split into oxygen gas molecules and four protons. Photolysis occurs in the thylakoid space. It's important to note that this oxygen, which diffuses out down its concentration gradient, is the same oxygen that you breathe. In step two, the electron transport chain uses the free energy in the electron pair to pump protons from the stroma into the thylakoid membrane, further increasing the proton concentration. So overall, we have an increased concentration of protons inside the thylakoid space. In step 3, which does occur simultaneously with step 1, light energy is collected by photosystem 1's reaction center. This energy is funneled into two electrons, which are then passed to the enzyme NADP reductase. To regain its lost electrons, photosystem 1 oxidizes the electron transport chain attached to photosystem 2, allowing the electron transport chain to take two electrons that were in low energy and bring them into this area so that they can then absorb additional light energy. This overall cycle repeats itself. In step 4, which occurs simultaneously with the next step, step 5, NADP reductase transfers the high energy pair of electrons taken from photosystem 1 and puts it into NAD+, which along with a proton produces NADPH. NADPH can be considered the reduced form of NADP+. 
So, some energy from the sun is now stored in this high energy dinucleotide. And recall, this is nicotinamide adenid adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Basically, it's a pair of nucleotides. You've seen adenine in DNA and RNA previously. This is, this is another function of it. In step 5, protons stored in the thylakoid space flow into special channels within the enzyme ATP synthase. This flow of protons is the driving force used by the enzyme to transfer an inorganic phosphate functional group onto ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, to create ATP. So in here, we have some of the energy from the sun now stored in the chemical bonds of ATP. Overall, the light-dependent reactions produce two high-energy molecules of ATP and NADPH, which, as we will see in the next section, are used to synthesize basic high-energy organic compounds. Overall, the simplified light-dependent chemical reaction can be shown as follows. Energy, which we get from the sun, plus ADP, plus inorganic phosphate, plus NADP+, plus, the oxidized form, plus some protons, produces ATP and NADPH, the two high energy molecules which we will funnel into the dark reactions, plus O2 gas generated which diffuses out of the leaf and into the air you breathe, plus some protons. This concludes the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis. Now let's go into some details of the light dependent reactions. Pigment molecules, which are located within the photosystems, catch photons. They include chlorophyll alpha and chlorophyll beta. The chlorophyll alpha and beta molecules differ in the exact wavelengths of light they can absorb. In addition to chlorophyll, there is also a class of pigments called carotenoids. These accessory pigments allow the plant to absorb other wavelengths of light that chlorophyll alpha and beta cannot. Together, between the chlorophyll alpha, beta, and carotenoids, many wavelengths of light can be absorbed by the reaction center. So, these pigments are compounds, which act as what we can see as light sponges, which absorb photons and hand them off into a central pair of chlorophyll molecules that together make up the reaction center. So here you can see light gets collected and absorbed by different pigment molecules, and you can picture these vibrating. They shake. And they transfer this vibrational energy into the center. And the center chlorophyll molecules vibrate more and more and more and more violently to the point where they eventually eject high energy electrons. When enough energy is put into the reaction center's electrons, the electrons get excited so much so that they leave, as I just said. This positively charged reaction center turns out to be one of the most powerful oxidants known in biochemistry. It is so powerful that it actually rips electrons away from water in the process we learned previously called photolysis, or breaking uh, water with light. And by the way, this pair of high energy electrons gets handed off to a molecule called plastoquinone, or just PQ. This is the first electron acceptor of the electron transport gene. This is a picture showing you the differences between chlorophyll alpha and beta. I believe this is alpha and this is beta. And you can see some key differences, such as the presence or absence of various functional groups. These very slight structural differences change the wavelengths of light that they can absorb. Here are the crystal structures of photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. As you can see, photosystem 2 is much more complex than photosystem 1, containing a great deal of more stuff. Incidentally, photosystem 1 is thought to have evolved well before photosystem 2, for reasons that we will not go into. You can run these uh, YouTube videos down here uh, that show the various ways You can click on these links here to see more complex versions of videos and animations on how the photosystems work. Though I should warn you, these videos are more complicated and well beyond the scope of what you must know.
for the purposes of this lecture. The electron transport chain, or ETC, consists of the initial electron acceptor compound, plastoquinone, as well as a series of cytochrome complexes, which are made of protein and other organic compounds. The high energy electrons from photosystem 2 are passed to plastoquinone, a molecule that more easily accepts electrons than the photosystem. It is a good oxidant or oxidizing agent. The electrons are then sequentially passed, quote, downhill to cytochromes, with the energy used to perform work in the form of pumping protons across the membrane. Now, if you think about energy flowing through space, for example, you put your hand out and you feel the warmth from a radiator, energy is being transferred through the air. Within a cell, if a cell needs to use that energy to do useful things, it can't very well have it diffuse all over the place randomly. Instead, cells use molecules to store that energy and shuttle it, like cargo, into areas where it needs it. So unless proteins are sitting right next to each other, they can, and can literally hand off high energy electrons, there needs to be a way to transport these high energy electrons around. How? The molecules you've seen, NADP, okay, that's nicotinamide adenosine dinucleotide phosphate. It's a pair of nucleotides bound together with a phosphate group. In addition, there are other dinucleotides. NAD, notice the lack of a phosphate group. FAD, or flavin adenosine dinucleotide, and FADP, etc. You can just see these complex molecules as carriers of the hot potato. Okay, the hot potato being the potato you put in a microwave and you absorb a tremendous amount of energy into. That would be the high energy electrons. Okay, so high energy electrons don't just move through space on their own, they're always carried. Okay, these are the guys with thick oven mitts. These molecules are strong enough and solid enough and stable enough to hold high energy electrons without being destroyed in the process. Now let's talk about the next series of reactions, the light independent reactions, sometimes called the dark reactions. Though it is important to note that just because it's called the dark reactions does not indicate it requires darkness. It just does not need light to proceed. The dark reactions are how photosynthesis works to create the high energy organic molecules we see in everyday life. It includes three steps. The light independent reactions include three steps. In addition, it's important to note that they have another name, which is not listed here, called the Calvin cycle. As its name implies, we're going to learn how it becomes a cycle. Okay, so something that repeats itself. The Calvin cycle has three steps. Note that step 1 and 2 must occur three times in total before step 3 can occur. Okay, briefly, step 1 involves carbon dioxide being fixed into the biosphere. Normally, carbon dioxide is a gas, and you can't very well build things out of gas. So the carbon within carbon dioxide's gas has to be placed into a solid form. This this movement from things to a gaseous state to a solid state in this manner is termed fixation or fixing it in place to do something with. The next step involves taking that carbon and putting energy into it. As we've learned previously putting energy into something involves the transfer of electrons and when you gain electrons you're said to be reduced. So step two is called carbon dioxide reduction. Finally in step three Step 3 regenerates the building blocks used in step 1, which we'll learn later is called ribulose bisphosphate. So let's look at a cartoon version of step 1. Step 1 is catalyzed by a single enzyme called RUBP carboxylase slash oxygenase. Now that's a mouthful, so scientists usually refer to this enzyme as rubisco. Rubisco utilizes carbon dioxide 
and another uh, molecule called ribulose bisphosphate. Ribulose bisphosphate is a 5-carbon molecule, relatively low in energy, although higher in energy than carbon dioxide. Along this path of slides, you'll notice that there's a top and a bottom, by the way. The top is going to show you some slightly different information than the bottom. Essentially, the bottom is just going to account for the carbons. So you can see here, here's carbon dioxide, and here's ribulose, oh, I'm sorry, ribulose bisphosphate. And by the way, this is an error in the slide. This should just be a P. The enzyme has a slash oxygenase. This is the compound RUBP. So there's an enzyme that links these two together called Rubisco, and it catalyzes the process by using ATP and NADPH to create a very high energy three carbon molecule called G3P. Now let's look at this again. RUBP, which is a five carbon molecule, is added to carbon dioxide that produces a six carbon molecule. This six carbon molecule then has energy pumped into it. This addition of energy causes the molecule to break apart into two high energy three carbon molecules. Okay, so again we have a six carbon molecule being converted into two high energy three carbon molecules. You can see the picture down here. Okay, six carbons gets converted into two three carbon high energy molecules. Now you can see here the first step of the Calvin cycle occurs with the process catalyzed by Rubisco. Step two and three are catalyzed by enzymes you don't need to worry about. It's just important to realize that both ATP and NADPH are involved in the process of creating G3P. So that's step one and step two. Now it's important to remember that this occurs three times. Okay, so at the end of the third, rot uh, the third rotation, we have a total of six high energy, three carbon molecules called G3P. Step three, which involves regenerating the RUBP, which you recall is a five carbon high energy, I'm sorry, low energy molecule, okay? We're going to take five of the six G3Ps that we created and we're going to recreate three RUBPs, okay? So again, if you count the carbons, we have a total here of 15 carbons okay which are currently split into five three carbon molecules five three carbon molecules what we're going to do is use the high energy molecules to drive reactions to rearrange them into three five carbon molecules okay if you remember from math the commutative property of multiplication five times three is the same as three times five Okay, and in the process of rearranging it, these molecules go back down in energy and are then fed back into step one again. That completes the cycle. Now if you notice, we've only used five of them. We had an extra. This extra one, well, that's our profit. Okay, so overall, going from the light independent reactions and creating ATP in NADPH, using the ATP and NADPH in the Calvin cycle and doing that three times eventually leads us to one high energy three carbon molecule. Here's another slide to help you study. So from the air you can see three carbon dioxide molecules. Those three carbon dioxide molecules together with three RUBPs Okay, catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco, are channeled into the second step of the reaction. The second step of the reaction puts the energy from ATP and NADPH into the molecules, generating six molecules of G3P. 
five of those G3Ps are used to recreate the RUBP, while one of them is our profit. Now let's talk about some details in step one. Now think about the diversity of organic compounds, a menagerie of different carbon backbones and functional groups. All of the carbon within proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates starts as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This form of carbon is a gas. Therefore, the very first step to creating an organic compound is to convert this gas into a useful solid form. We anchor it in place. We fix or attach the carbon to a solid scaffold. Once the carbon dioxide is fixed in place as a usable source of carbon, energy is added to the system. We're building, right? Remember redox. Endergonic reactions, which use ATP and NADPH created in the light reactions, build what is essentially the building block for all organic compounds, including glucose, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P. Here's a picture showing the details of step two. Again, these details you don't need to know for the test, but it's important to see them at least once. 3-phosphoglycerate, or 3-PG, otherwise known as PGAL. You might see PGAL in the book, you might see PGAL in a test or the final. So it's important to realize that phosphoglyceraldehyde is the same thing as 3-phosphoglycerate. These are equivalent, there's just two different names. So 3-PG, or PGAL, has ATP combined with it, and it creates bisphosphoglycerate. Bisphosphoglycerate is further reduced to create the high energy G3P. Okay, and recall that as the 3PG becomes G3P, ATP becomes ADP plus inorganic phosphate. Okay, in other words, don't forget that the ADP in inorganic phosphate and the NADP plus are also products of this reaction. These are then fed back into the light reactions. These are the discharged batteries that must be replenished before further Calvin cycle activity can occur. Okay, and this is the step, step two, in which we say carbon dioxide is reduced to a carbohydrate. Okay, now let's just think about that for a minute. Carbohydrate, remember the from a previous chapter, the definition of a carbohydrate was something, an organic molecule, that had a ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen of one to two to one. Now let's think about it this way. There's carbon dioxide, okay? And we add some water to it. Oh, let me let me redo that. Let me start this all over again. So in step two, this is the step in which carbon dioxide is reduced to a carbohydrate. Recall that carbohydrates are molecules with a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1 of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So what we've essentially done is we've added energy to carbon dioxide. We've reduced it. Okay, so normally there's your carbon dioxide, and I'm just looking at the elements. And we're reducing it. We're adding some hydrogen and electrons, and we basically form the carbohydrate. In step three, the regeneration of ribulose bisphosphate The Calvin cycle is just that, a cycle. That means it keeps turning. 
unless we have a way to make more of the starting material, our UBP, the cycle would stop. This is why the cycle itself produces our UBP as one of its products. How? We go through the first two steps three times, producing six G3Ps, and we use that G3P to make more of the RABP back. And in that process, we generate one G3P left over in the process. All that work for one small piece of G3P. Here's a picture showing the diversity of organic molecules that plants can make by starting with G3P. Taking two molecules of G3P and putting them together, you can create the 6-carbon glucose molecule that we've talked about in the past. Glucose, in turn, can be conjugated to fructose, or bonded to it chemically, to create the disaccharide sucrose, or table sugar. In addition, however, things we don't talk about in this class, G3P can also be used to generate fatty acids as well as amino acids. All 20 amino acids, in other words, can be created from the starting material of G3P plus other nutrients, of course. So you can see here that plants generate all of the molecules they need simply by starting with water, carbon dioxide, and energy. By the way, glucose can also be used in chains, which we've learned about in the past, to make both starch and cellulose. Now let's talk about a process that negatively affects some plants, called photorespiration. First of all, the word respiration means breathing out carbon dioxide. You and I normally respire. This is a good thing. Some plants also respire. That's not a good thing. C3 plants, which are the ones that we've talked about thus far, are called C3 plants because the final product of the first chemical reaction in the Calvin cycle is a 3-carbon molecule. The enzyme that catalyzes the first reaction, which is RUBP plus carbon dioxide, is called Rubisco, as we've mentioned earlier. The problem is Rubisco is unable to distinguish between the substrates carbon dioxide and oxygen. Normally, carbon dioxide is fixed to RUBP, which leads to the production of G3P. This is what the plant is supposed to do. Unfortunately, sometimes oxygen is also used in place of carbon dioxide. This leads to the breakdown of RUBP into carbon dioxide. It is because of this competition between carbon dioxide and oxygen that makes RUBP carboxylase slash oxygenase one of the most inefficient enzymes on the planet. Only a few molecules can be synthesized per second. How does photorespiration lead to death? Normally, stomates are open, or rather stoma, are open in a temperate environment. This allows oxygen to freely leave the leaf and carbon dioxide to freely come in. REBP, in this case, uses CO2 because it's more plentiful than oxygen. The benefit of this is the Calvin cycle remains active and the plant persists. The drawback is that the plant loses water, but it does gain fresh water from the soil. When a C3 plant is exposed to hot and or dry environments, the stomate closes through action of the guard cells. This allows the plant to maintain its, its water supply. Now think about walking through the desert. What's more important, eating or drinking? Right, drinking. You can go several days, several weeks even, depending on your body type, without food, but you can only go a short time without water. Plants are no different. They need to conserve water, even if it's at the expense of being unable to produce carbohydrates. So in the hot, dry environment, the stomate closes, and this causes the oxygen concentration to increase. It causes the carbon dioxide levels to decrease, why? Well, the cells are using carbon dioxide in the Calvin cycle, and they're generating O2 in the light reactions. 
So RUBP in this situation will use oxygen because it's more plentiful than carbon dioxide. The benefit of this situation is that the plant does not lose water through the leaves. However, the Calvin cycle remains inactive. If left in a hot and dry environment for long enough periods of time, the C3 plants will eventually perish. Plants have evolved mechanisms to counter this waste depending on the environment. The hotter and drier the environment gets, the more plants have to cope with balancing the rate of water loss against photosynthesis. C4 plants get around this problem of photorespiration by fixing carbon dioxide in a slightly different way. First, let's examine the physical differences in how C4 leaves are organized compared with C3 leaves. As you can see in this picture, C4 plants have concentric circles surrounding the vein. You can see the inside cells here are called bundle sheath cells, similar to the C3 plants. The difference is these bundle sheath cells have chloroplasts. Surrounding the bundle sheath cells is a layer of mesophyll cells. Notice how organized these are compared to C3 plants. The key here is the bundle sheath cells are trapped inside. They are unable to produce gas exchange between the atmosphere. Mesophyll cells in C4 plants fix carbon dioxide differently than in C3 plants. Instead of using RUBP, they use PEP, which is a three carbon molecule. When PEP is fixed to carbon dioxide, it produces malate, a four carbon molecule. Malate, the four carbon molecule, is the namesake of C4 plants. The final product of the first reaction is a four carbon molecule. This reaction is catalyzed by a different, more specific enzyme called PEP carboxylase. Unlike its cousin Rubisco, PEP carboxylase does not use oxygen, so C4 plants don't suffer from, under, from photorespiration. Here's the basic mechanism. In the first step, the mesophyll cells take in carbon dioxide. PEP carboxylase fixes this to malate. This occurs here. Then the malate is pumped across the membrane of the mesophyll cells into the bundle sheath cells here. This is very energetically expensive. The malate in the bundle sheath cells then breaks back down into carbon dioxide, where the rubisco then fixes carbon dioxide to RUBP, and the rest of the Calvin cycle occurs. In other words, C4 plants have all of the same mechanisms in place as the C3 plants, but this occurs inside the bundle sheath cells. Notice they are hidden away from the rest of the environment. So when the stomach closes and oxygen levels rise, even though the mesophyll cells are exposed to these higher concentrations of oxygen, the bundle sheath cells are safe because they have malate being pumped in constantly. So the RUBP inside the bundle sheath cell is exposed to local high concentrations of carbon dioxide from the malate breaking down. In this way, C4 plants can successfully continue the Calvin cycle even in a hot or dry environment. So the key here is carbon fixation, which occurs initially in the mesophyll cells, is separated from the reduction steps. CAM plants are different from C4 plants in that they do not separate the two processes physically. Instead, they separate them in time. So an example of a cam plant would be a cactus. At nighttime in the desert, temperatures can drop well below freezing. This is because sand cannot hold a lot of energy at any given time. It gives it right back. Think about putting aluminum in the stove or putting aluminum in the oven. When you open the oven, you can very easily touch the aluminum quickly because it has a very low specific heat. Sand has a low specific heat. So in the desert, even though the sun is raining down all through the day and it gets very hot, when the sun goes down, the sand quickly gives up that energy and as a result the air temperature drops. When it's cool, the stomach can open from the cactus. This allows the plant to breathe in carbon dioxide.
and it allows it to leave to to remove the oxygen. CO2 is then fixed and stored in very large vacuoles. As the sun comes up and the temperature rises, the stomates close. This keeps the water inside safe and sound, and at the same time, the plant can undergo the rest of the Calvin cycle by releasing carbon dioxide from the stored up malate. This is a very expensive process, and cam plants do not have high efficiencies of photosynthesis, but they can survive in the desert. So a C3 plant, a C4 plant, and a cam plant out in the desert, the cam plant wins. In a hot, humid environment, a C4 plant would win over a C3 plant. But in a temperate environment, the C3 plant always wins. Why? Because the C3 plant can undergo photosynthesis at a much more rapid, efficient pace. It doesn't need to store carbon dioxide as malate. It doesn't need to pump it. It doesn't need to produce vacuoles of it it can just very efficiently and quickly produce large quantities of G3P, so long as the temperature is temperate. This is why in the summertime, your normal grass can be seen to be slowly replaced with things like crabgrass. That's because crabgrass is an example of a C4 plant. In a hot environment, crabgrass wins. Here's a summary slide showing you how the carbon dioxide fixation and reduction steps are isolated from each other in the C4 and CAM plants. On the left, you can see C3 plants. All of the three steps of the Calvin cycle occur within one cell, the mesophyll cells. In C4 plants, you can see that the reduction and regeneration steps occur in different cells from the fixation, where in CAMPs, in camp plants, you can see that the carbon dioxide fixation and reduction steps occur at different times during the day. This concludes Chapter 7's Photosynthesis Lecture.